God bless you. Thank you, Lisa, Aunt Sue, and Miss Fay. If you have a copy of God's Word, I would love for you to turn with me to the book of Acts, the book of Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, and we'll begin reading there in verse 1 uh, here in a few moments. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. Just find your place there and then just kind of uh, wait on me for just a few minutes. And uh, I want to, to kind of share with you some things that's on my heart and, and um, what uh, we're going to be, uh, for lack of better words, a, a, a direction that we're going to be heading in. We're going to, um, just for a season... Uh, we're going to be stepping away from the Gospel of Mark. Uh, I've, um, I, I pray that I've been obedient uh, in listening to the Holy Spirit and uh, for us to spend a, a season in a direction that we're, that we're going to be heading to, and I'm not being uh, apprehensive about it or keeping it a secret. It's just as we move forward in our time together this morning, I pray that God will just, uh, he'll kind of unroll and reveal um, what we are going to be dealing with and talking about. Uh, I will tell you that um, um, I, I started thinking about this and praying about it. Uh, this is no type of knee-jerk response or anything. And it was through the past couple weeks that I was uh, uh, continuing, even though you know, you're down sometimes, you're still, you're still important to spend uh, time with God in prayer, reading His Word in quiet time and, and thing of that nature. And, and, and when you're down for a while, sometimes all you have is just you and God. Amen. And uh, you just spend time with him, and and um, we could have uh, we could have done this earlier, maybe, but um, but I just uh, I, I I just wanted to pray through it, and I, my prayer today, uh, even this morning, as soon as I got through preaching at nine o'clock, um, uh, I, I uh, nobody was uh, I'm, I'm not saying this being mean, nobody responded. And you, if it's nobody's responding and there's just something on my heart, I'll spend time at the altar for a few minutes. And, and I just knelt right there in front of the communion table and prayed. And I said, God, am I doing your will? I said, is this what you want uh, and for us to be doing and concentrating on? And, and so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still here and was led uh, to continue uh, with 11 o'clock where we were at at 9 o'clock. And uh, again, just kind of be patient, but be patient because I just want it all kind of to make sense to you uh, in a way. And if, if I, I want to ask you, um, I want to ask you a question. And now when you answer it, I don't want you to answer me. I want you to answer God. Is it a desire of yours? And I, Mr. Don, I hope this don't upset you, but uh, Pastor Charlie made a comment at Miss Claire's funeral. And it really, it really pierced my heart. And, and I'm going to leave the name out because it, it, it's, I just, I don't know why I'm sharing this, but Pastor Charlie was talking about going to see someone and he was talking to them about their salvation. And he made the statement he said because that's what you do when you're a pastor and the Holy Spirit just just kind of moved and spoke to me and and um, you know I listened to every word he said obviously but that was 
That was something that spoke to me. Mr. Don Stanley, you remember him saying that? And, um, and, and that kind of helped me. Uh, Don Evans texted me yesterday. He says, are you at the beach? <laughs> I said, no, sir. I said, I'm trying to get my head and my heart around tomorrow, meaning today. So I, I, I really want you to, to hear from God this morning and kind of understand the weight of, of what we're going to be talking about. And if you can somehow um, – Lord, give me a word here. Understand the severity of it. But my question is, and, and don't vote, don't nod. I'm not asking for that. Right here. Do you desire to see people saved? Can I say it another way? Do you even care if anybody gets saved? And, and I ask, and, and I ask myself that question. And, and, and as a church, and I don't know how many's here right now. It doesn't matter, but we're here, and God's here. Amen. Jesus is here. And, and, and with, the, with the ministry and with, with everything that's going on, and, and you know, you, you, can, you can be deceived, you can, be, you can hear all the noise of the world and everything that's going on between COVID and mask and, and Haiti and Afghanistan, and, and sometimes you can just get bogged down. And I think sometimes people just try to be smarter than what they really are and, and predict all these things and say all these things about prophecies and things of that. And you know, Know what I don't I don't I don't know when Jesus is coming back Kelly I, I do not know uh, I I will tell you and I know exactly where I'm standing okay I, 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 I do not know when Jesus is coming back I am not smart enough as a student of the Word of God to, to tell you that the planets are lining up and all this is happening, that the Lord is coming back because of this and because of that, I am not smart enough to know that. When God wants me to know that, He'll reveal it to me if He wants me to know that. We're going to understand it better by and by one day, but there's still going to be some things that God does not want us to know while we're here on earth. As a matter of fact, when I die and get to heaven, if He still don't want me to know it, He's not going to tell me there either. But this is what I do know. He's coming back. He is coming back. And we need to have a desire to see people get saved. I love what Paul said in Romans. He says, my heart's desire and my prayer to God is that they may be saved. And, and God, God, some people say, well, God had a plan. I agree with that. But more importantly, I want to tell you that God had a man. And his name was Jesus. Some 2,000 years ago, God literally, literally stepped out of heaven and stepped on earth and wrapped himself in flesh and came and died for you and me as a sinner. And you know how much, let me tell you something, and I'm not being facetious. I just want to grab your attention with this statement. Do you know what God did when, when God wanted the message of Jesus Christ to go out? Now, I know God used Jesus. Don't, don't mix my words here. I know God used Jesus' life, and I know who Jesus is. He's the Son of God. He is our Redeemer. Uh, he died for our sins. He paid the debt we couldn't pay. But when God wanted the message of Jesus Christ to go out to that world, do you know what God did? He told 12 men. He told 12 ordinary men and gathered them together. 
And those, because of those 12 men, I truly believe, not taking anything from Jesus Christ, but because of those 12 men and their faith and obedience that they had a desire for people to know about the man of Jesus Christ, the plan of salvation, and the gospel of our Lord and Savior. It is because of those 12 men that we're able to sit here today under the banner of Jesus Christ and preach, proclaim, sing, and praise about the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what about us today? In Matthew chapter 28, we all know this passage of scriptures. Uh, Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 19, it's Jesus speaking to his disciples. I also would like to add that he's speaking to us today. What does he say? Jesus says, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Watch this now, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them. Hang on. Teaching them to observe all things. Not some things. Not one or two things. But all things that I have commanded you. We have, and we know this, and looking around this congregation this morning sitting here, this congregation, we call this the Great Commission that Jesus Christ has given His disciples. I love what Jonathan Dobson calls it. He said it's the gospel commission of taking out the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's this call here to disciples for us to go out and to tell others about Jesus Christ. That go there, that first word, those two letters, literally means that as you are going, as we are going out about our day, as we are being served at a restaurant, as we are walking around Walmart, as we are working on our jobs, as we are in our homes, no matter what we're doing or where we're at or, or, or where we're going, but as we're going, we're to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why would we not tell somebody about Jesus? We'll tell them about everything else. Well, Jason, I'm... I'm I'm hesitant because I don't know what they're going to say. Sir, ma'am, it don't matter what they're going to say. Our job, by the way, it's not you that saved them. It's Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit. We're to be obedient. We're to do what... Because as a child of God, as a Christian, sir, ma'am, please know that we have the Holy Spirit living within us. And it is the Holy Spirit that does the work. And we're to be obedient and in that. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, the Bible says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and the Holy Spirit dwells in you? And we're to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. That's how we do it. But why do we do it? I don't know any other way of saying this. Because Jesus said so. And I'm, I'm serious, Miss Danette, if Jesus tells me to do something, I think I better be doing it. Because I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I don't know if you think about this often or not, but every one of us, every last one of us, one day is going to give an account to God Almighty for what we've done with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 14. There is coming a day those people in hell that's in hell right now, they may, they may have not bowed their knees and confessed with their mouth, but there's coming a day that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we're going to stand before God and give an account of our life. And what did we do with Jesus while we were here on earth? I truly believe that. Jesus said for us to do it because all authority, just prior to uh, 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 Matthew 28, 18, just prior to that, Jesus tells us that he has been given. Watch this now. He has been given. He has been given all the authority in heaven and on earth. And we need to be listening to Jesus. I don't know if I shared this with you or not. I, I can't remember. But this morning's a little bit different. Okay. You may be thinking, we ain't even got to Acts chapter 19. It's okay. I want to show, in just a few seconds, 
Uh, ben, if you would be so kind to bring these house lights down just a little bit. I, I want to show you what I want to show you what we're talking about and where we're going with this short video from North Carolina Baptist. It is a movement that is a, going across this state. It is called Fill the Tank, the Baptistry. And all churches across North Carolina are being asked to be encouraged, are being prayed for, that we are to fill the tank on September the 12th and baptize just as many people as we can. Will you watch this video, and while you're watching it, will you pray for God to move at Soldier Bay Baptist Church? From the majestic mountains in the west to the roaring waves in the east, North Carolina Baptist will unite this September for the Fill the Tank Baptism Sunday. God is moving now in the hearts of His people, and evangelistic efforts are preparing a harvest of new believers. Churches across the state are encouraging these new believers to take their first steps of obedience through baptism. Baptism symbolizes a person's new life in Christ as they publicly identify with His death, burial, and resurrection. Baptism is a beautiful picture of the gospel to others. Emphasizing baptism on a single day allows churches from various backgrounds, languages, and styles of worship to celebrate together how God is moving in our churches. Whether you use a baptistry, a tub, a pool, or the ocean, we hope you will commit to fill your tank on September 12th. North Carolina Baptist, let's be a movement of churches on mission together as we pray and believe God to draw people to himself. I don't know what all God is doing here at Soldier Bay Baptist Church and in, er in other churches and area churches around this county, but I truly believe more than ever God is on a move in our heart and in our life and in our churches, especially here at Soldier Bay Baptist Church. And it's my prayer to, as your pastor, to lead us in this time approaching uh, September the 12th that we'll fill this tank. But you know what? What One thing that I was being led in in prayer and thinking about and preparing to get to this point, one thing that the, the, one, of the very few, the, one of the very most crucial things that I want us to understand as a congregation and as, as, and as a church is before we can fill the tank, our hearts have got to be filled with Jesus first. You see, baptism comes after conversion. Hey, we're not baptized. We don't get saved because we're baptized. We get baptized because we've been saved. Amen. It is an act of obedience. Uh, there's confusion even with baptism this day and time of why we get baptized, how come we get baptized. Some people get baptized because they've seen other people baptized. There's questions and concerns about what age do you uh, baptize a child and, and the age of an accountability and all of that. And it's my goal as we prepare, move, and plan, we're going to be addressing and talking about all that. But more importantly, my prayer and this passage of Scripture this morning that I want to share with you and the message that God has laid upon my heart is for us to begin to saturate with prayer for God to move in the lives of, of individuals that do not know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior in every area of your life that you come in contact with. I'm going to talk about a little bit more in depth about that tonight, prayerfully. But to begin praying for God to move and for people to get saved, because I don't know about you, but do you know anybody that needs to be saved this morning? I know some people that need to be saved this morning. I want to help you and show you about how we can be praying for that and saturating that uh, for those individuals for prayer. In Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 5, I want you to look at something that I've titled this morning, Disciples in the Dark. Disciples in the Dark. And what's going on here is that Paul has arrived in Ephesus. 
He had mentioned to them in his second missionary journey that he was going to come back there if it was God's will. And it was God's will for Paul to go back to Ephesus. And he came, and, and in verse 19, we pick up this story of him arriving back at Ephesus. And he actually stayed there uh, for two years starting this church at Ephesus. And he was very involved. Matter of fact, if you keep on, if you keep on reading, I believe it's around uh, verse 8 or verse 9, you'll see that he, is, uh, he, he has a very packed schedule. He actually teaches and preaches not only in the synagogue, but also in what you've read before, that of the school of Tyrannius. And he is there just preaching and saturating uh, Ephesus and the community there with the gospel of Jesus Christ. One thing that we need to understand and pick up before we pick up verse 19 or chapter 19, verse 1, I think we need to appreciate and understand just prior to that about the preacher uh, by the name of Apollos. Now, Apollos was preaching there in Ephesus, and the Bible gives you that in verse 24. I'm not going to read that for sake of time, but I would love for and invite you to read that maybe when you get home. Don't do it while I'm preaching. That's rude, but um, I'm kidding. But uh, but we, we see Apollos there preaching, and there's a part of Apollos uh, Paulus's sermon, the Bible says that he's a dear man of God, of, of the Scripture. And in his sermon, he leaves out the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, this particular area, this particular time, especially with Apollos and the disciples that we're getting ready to read about, were they did not, they were not aware of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were aware of the man of Jesus Christ because they were all familiar with the message and the sermon of John the Baptist. They were students and disciples of John the Baptist and participated in the baptism of repentance. Well, when he was preaching one day, thankful for the, you talk about the, w, uh, the WMU, Mr. Don, but thankful for Priscilla and Aquila uh, being there and getting Apollos and talking to him about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the scripture plainly tells us that they reveal to him about the birth, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he's, he's been sent further on his way of being supported and preaching then, adding to his sermons about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when I say the gospel of Jesus Christ, I pray that you understand what I mean about the life, the death, the ministry, the resurrection, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And right after we deal with this in Acts chapter 18, we arrive at Acts chapter 19 and verse 1 and the Bible says and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul having passed through the upper regions came to Ephesus and finding some disciples. Now I want you, if you mark in your Bible, I want you to underline that some disciples. And finding some disciples he said to them did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? And they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him, Jesus Christ, who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And in verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, thank you. May I decrease and you increase. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we have Paul here in verse 1. He's arriving at Ephesus. And I want you to note something here that just really stuck out to me. And in verse 1, after it says he came to Ephesus, the Bible says, and finding some disciples... How did Paul know that these were disciples? Now, one of the very first questions you're going to ask, and one of the, if, you, if you want to study and, and really understand this, I will tell you that there's a little bit of confusion about this word disciple here. One thing I will share with you, because I really want you to get this and understand this, and don't think I'm just giving you information. I want you to get this and understand what's going on here, is one thing that when Luke uses this word disciples here, it is at times in, 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 in Greek, there are times that disciples can be very specific. When you look at Jesus' disciples, that's very specific. When you look at the disciples of John, that's very specific 
obviously with the with, with with one complimenting the other. There are times in the Greek where disciples can be used in a broader, greater spectrum of those that may be followers or dedicated or committed. So we have this word here that 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 Luke gives us, where Paul says that he he have mercy that he finds some disciples. Well, who are these disciples of? That's one of the biggest questions in this text. Because there's a division here of those that know a lot more about Scripture than I do that's saying that it's disciples of Jesus Christ. Or it's the disciples of John. I think when you look at all of it and you keep it in context, you realize that these are disciples of John because they were there when John was preaching the message of repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Don't ever forget that John was preaching and prophesizing that the Messiah was coming. And he in fact did come. Say amen. He in fact did come and he's preaching this. And so the question is, because I want to connect all the dots for clarity, the question is, how could they have been with John the Baptist and followed through with the baptism of repentance because the baptism of repentance is the baptism that John did because you needed to repent and be baptized. It wasn't the baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because the Lord Jesus Christ hadn't come yet. So it was an obedient baptism participating in that of repentance, of crying out before God and saying, I'm sorry for my sins. And by the way, repentance isn't just saying, God, I'm sorry. Repentance is turning from your sin. And so these disciples are here and, and Paul comes up to them. And one thing that I can't understand is how did he know they were disciples? Luke doesn't, Luke doesn't go in a lot of detail there. But it's there for a reason, if not for anybody else, for me. How did he know they were disciples? So I see in this text where, you know what, you can, you can dress like a disciple. You can walk like a disciple. You can talk like a disciple. You can look the part. You can come to church. Every time that door's open, pandemic or not, you can be sitting right here. Last Sunday, you could have came right here and sat right there and, and looked the part. You can buy all kind of t-shirts with crosses and fish and everything else. You can look the part. But the question is, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? And Paul asked them this question. I think this is so cool, Mr. Don, either one of you. They, he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Has any of you, I, I got a question, you don't have to vote. Have any of you ever asked anybody that question? Usually we don't word when we're witnessing Lisa, uh, you know, I just want to ask you, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you got saved? We don't, but note what Paul's doing. Paul's getting to the heart of the matter. You know why? Because something is off. Something is off about these disciples. I'm not picking on them. But Paul notices something about them, and he asked the question, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now watch this. So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Don't get mad at me, y'all, but they didn't have a clue. Th they didn't have a clue about what was going on here and what Paul was doing. And in other words, how they were being set up. But look what they said. They said no. So I've got a question for you this morning. Uh, don't vote. Don't, don't, don't nod or... You can keep the face you've got on right now, but i got a question for you this morning that I want you to answer before Holy God. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So in other words, I'm asking you, do you have the Holy Spirit living in your life right now? Do you know without a shadow of a doubt that you have the Holy Spirit living within you right now? So the question is, 
How in the world do I know if I have the Holy Spirit in my life or not right now? The, the answer to that question is you just know. Billy Graham said it this way, and it's one of the best quotes I've ever heard about the Holy Spirit. And I know being Billy Graham said it, y'all going to listen to it. Billy Graham said that you know the Holy Spirit is there because the Holy Spirit illuminates the minds of people. It makes us yearn for God and takes spiritual truth and makes it understandable to us. That is when the Holy Spirit is present in our life. There is, watch this now, there is a yearning for God. Do you have a yearning for God this morning? Do you have a yearning for people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus Christ? If you have the Holy Spirit living within you, then you do. I also want to share with you this morning a word of warning. If you do not have the Holy Spirit living within you, sir, ma'am, you are not saved based upon the authority of the Word of God. So what we have to look at, you see, before we can fill a tank, we have our lives have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Do y'all understand what I'm trying to say this morning? Is we have to know that we are saved. Don't worry about figuring everything out. I used this illustration this morning without his permission. Mr. Don Evans has said on numerous occasions when it's dealing with his testimony or he's bringing out a point, whether he's standing in Sunday school, whether he's standing in the parking lot in a conversation with you, whether he's at the office or whether when it's been his time behind this sacred desk, he will tell you that the night that he got saved, he went straight home, sat in the middle of the floor, and asked God, what just happened to me? Is that what you did? The Holy Spirit in the light. You're not going to figure everything out. Can I say that? And, 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 I, and, I, and I don't want to be disrespectful here to the Holy Spirit, but sometimes, so, you know, sometimes you just don't know. It just don't make sense what God's doing in your life, and what God will do, and what the or more specifically, what the Holy Spirit will do. And by the way, your first encounter with the Holy Spirit is at the moment of your salvation, because it was the Holy Spirit that initiated the salvation process. Because it's the Holy Spirit that leads the conviction of sin in your life, and it's at that point that you realize you're a sinner in need of a Savior, and you need His grace to be saved. That's your first encounter with the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit begins to do things and, and work in your life. Matter of fact, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul, Paul talks about putting off new things. Excuse me, putting off old things. Matter of fact, more specifically, he says, put off your old self, which belongs to your former life, because that is corrupt through the deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And then he says, to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Do you know what you have to do for God to give you life? You first have to allow God to kill you. You have to die to self. And realize that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And Paul looks at these disciples. Some people get it wrong. And I'm not, I'm not picking on anybody. But some people just get it wrong. I call it messy theology. Some people I've heard say through this uh, short time as a pastor, or time as a youth pastor, and as a time of being a Christian, they simply believe that being a Christian is changing your life. 
And I want you to listen. If you've not heard anything else, I want you to listen to me right now. Being a Christian is not about you changing your life. Being a Christian is about Jesus changing your life. And the Holy Spirit that's within you. I don't... One of the first funerals that I ever preached was over 20, around 25 years ago. I wasn't even a funeral director. I was in the parking lot. There was a funeral going on. Um, it was a graveside service. Thank the Lord. That'll make sense in a minute. And I was standing in the parking lot at Brunswick Funeral Service out there by Highway 17 doing what I knew to do. And Larry came up to me and he says, do you still have your Bible on your desk? I said, yes, sir. He said, we need you to go preach that graveside service. That was around 25 years ago. I, obviously, I didn't know the individual. I don't know how many funerals I've preached in those tw since those 25 years. I got, I got, I don't know, have mercy. Let me, I, I was, I've never shared, I don't know why I should share this now or not, but I've never told anybody this before in my life. Let me tell you how strong the Holy, let me tell you when you know the Holy Spirit's in your life. I was walking at a guilty distance. I looked like a disciple. When I used to do funerals for people I didn't know, I wouldn't stand in the pulpit of the chapel. Because I knew I'd never, I shouldn't be standing behind that pulpit in that chapel pretending to be something I was not. The Holy Spirit would not let me stand behind that sacred desk in that funeral home chapel. I was even asked, why don't you get in the pulpit? I'm not, I can't. You can judge me, you can do whatever you want, but I'm going to tell you right now, the Holy Spirit is real. The Holy Spirit is alive. And you have Him or you don't. And when I've preached funerals for families, one at one point or another, I'm going to ask you about their faith. Obviously, they've already, they're already deceased. I can't talk with them. I'm going to ask you about their faith. And a lot of times, the families will say, oh, they went to church. Okay. A month ago, I preached a funeral of a dear friend. I called him. He was sick. We talked a long time. I was sitting right over there in the office. And I called him. I did not know it was going to be the last time I was going to talk to him. And I called him by name. I says, tell me about your faith. He said, oh, I was baptized. I didn't ask you if you were baptized. I grew up in church. I didn't ask you if you grew up in church. I want you to tell me about your relationship with Jesus Christ. Those disciples looked at Paul and said, "We've been baptized. We, we've been we've been baptized." Paul said, "You're not saved." It's bad theology. 
talked to a dear lady yesterday, a friend of mine. I found out she was sick. I called her. We had a great conversation. She has a tumor in her stomach the size of a basketball. And before I started to pray with her, I said, and I called her by name. I said, tell me about your faith. You know what she said? I went to church when I was little. I'm not asking you if you went to church. And I'm not asking you all this morning if you've been baptized. Obviously, I'm not asking you if you come to church. My question is, do you have the Holy Spirit living within you? My question literally is this. Do you know this morning that you're saved? Without a shadow of a doubt. You know, looking around, I kind of know. And, 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 and I'm not talking about you. But do you know the most comfortable place you can sit in and go straight to hell? It's the church pew. See, only God knows the heart. And only you know the heart, your heart. I'm not asking you if you're a member of Soldier Bay. I'm not asking if you've been christened as a baby. I'm not asking you if you've been dedicated as a baby. I'm asking you this morning, do you know that you have been saved and that you have the Holy Spirit living within you? Can you answer that this morning and say, yes, I know without a shadow of a doubt? You see, these are the things we have to deal with. And if there's ever been a time, I think it's now more than ever that people need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then the Holy Spirit move in their life and convict them of their sin and they be saved under the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. And then, sir and ma'am, it doesn't stop there. I don't want to get into this right now, but more important than ever, it is time that our new believers be discipled as a believer of Jesus Christ. And that is where I fall short as a pastor to this congregation at Soldier Bay Baptist Church. And God is working me and whipping me about that area of my pastorate. And I've got to change or either step down as your pastor before the Lord wears me out. We encourage people to walk the aisle. And if we're not careful, we never encourage them anymore on how to walk as a Christian. And we have to be disciple. Will you begin to pray now as the musicians come? Will you begin to pray now for God to move in this time in our church, in our community? Not that just we might fill the tank on September the 12th, but that people will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe there's somebody you need to be praying for. Maybe there's somebody you want to invite. I'm going to be on this topic until September the 12th. My prayer is, whether it's one, whether it's 100 or 1,000, I'm going to stay faithful to the task of preaching evangelism up till September the 12th. You know what? We, may not be, we might not be able to have church inside. We may not be able to get everybody in the baptistry with changing rooms. I tell you what, right now, there's a lot of water at Powerway. There's even more water at Ocean Isle Beach. Say amen, Brandy. We'll go wherever we need to go. But more importantly, right now, will you commit right now? Now, there's two questions right now. You either don't belong to God or you do. Which one is it? If you don't, can I encourage you to come this morning? If you do, will you submit and commit to the will of the Holy Spirit right now? and join me and join each other in praying for heaven to come down 
at Soldier Bay Baptist Church, at our area churches, surrounding churches, in our community, in our county, in our state, as we move forward to fill the tank. Sir, ma'am, do not be a disciple in the dark. Come this morning to Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this time. Thank you for your word this morning, Lord. Now, once again, Father, this invitation is not mine. It is yours. Have your will and way. Father, I pray right now that you move in the only way that you can. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Will you stand? And will you come? If you need to talk to me, I'll be standing right here. Or maybe you want to come this morning and just pray for that person or those people to be saved and for God to move. Please come. Good morning. Thank you so much for being with us this morning with our online services here at Soldier Bay. We were so, we're so glad that you joined us. Here on the screen, you see our email address and our phone number to the church office. Is God dealing with you about something this morning? We would love to pray with you. We would love to speak to you. If we can help you during this time of a prayer concern or, or maybe it's your relationship with the Lord. Maybe it's your walk. Whatever your spiritual need is this morning, please feel free to reach out to us. As always, God is good all the time. Thank you. God bless.